So welcome, Johanna. And um, we are recording this so we can share this with some of our non-readers and we'll put it on our YouTube channel so that people can access it later so we can understand more about, we're just so interested in your story and how you came to choose this. And um, some of us, one person listened, three of us read, one has not read it yet, but then we do have other people that weren't able to join us today for a variety of um, reasons. And so we, I said I'd record it and share it with them. Wonderful. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to be here. Can you just tell me a little synopsis of sort of your group makeup and how often you meet and what your mission is, just so I have an idea? Yes. So we, um, we meet monthly. Um, this particular, now Allison and I have been in for a few years and then Allison took a year off and then the other group, is, this is their second year together. And then Barbara, who you see, is a writer and Barbara is our professional facilitator. So Barbara comes and helps keep us on track and make sure that we um, ask the right questions and again, just keep us professional. Um, this learning leadership reading group started about four years ago now in the Orange County um, Fieldstone Leadership Network. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this is just for us to read all kinds of books, fiction, nonfiction, and prescriptive, prescriptive nonfiction. Um, and analyze it and talk about it through the lens of leadership. And the goal is that all of us by the end of the one year, even though this group continues to meet, that we know how to facilitate a reading group so that we could go back to our organizations and hopefully do some of that with, our, with the people that we work with. So we have a um, pretty extensive book list and we, for the most part, choose books off of that and we alternate, you know, again, one genre, one month and we switch it. Um, but we certainly are open because this group has been together now for a couple of years. We are open to going out in the community. And if we hear a really good book, we'll do it and we'll read that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just discuss it. So typically the first three months, Barbara will help facilitate it. And then after the first three months, one of us will facilitate it. Sometimes we do it in pairs and sometimes we do it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Great. And do you often have the author come and chat with you when you're done with the book? We haven't. No, you're our first one. Oh, exciting. Great. Yeah. So, um, no, because, you know, we would love to have some of these people. We were hoping Michelle Obama would join us, but I think she had <laughs> other things to do that day. We were hoping that Barack Obama would join us, but he had other things to do. So, you know, I do reach out to these people, you know, via whatever mechanisms through social media and I tell them what we're doing. And certainly with the last year and a month now, we have been doing it via Zoom. And right. so it certainly would make it a lot easier for writers to just jump in. Yeah. And so, yeah. Again, we're just so grateful that, that you jumped in and agreed to do this. Great. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. And is it my understanding, did you read Into Thin Air as one of your books recently? Yes, that's, how you found, that's how you found me. So I had to put right. something on our social media about that. So yes, we did read that. And that was about three, three, three or four books ago. Oh my gosh. So you guys are like mountain climbing experts now. You could practice, you basically all climbed Mount Everest at this point. Pretty much. Right. <laughs> Excellent. And Great. I'm going to take a picture just for our social media. So okay. if everybody would just lean in and smile. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, I told Robin that what I usually have is about a 20 minute photo presentation. Um, and then I'm happy to take questions and answers. This is such a great book as it relates to leadership. So I'm excited to talk about that angle. But the book, you know, as you know, having read it, it brings up so many interesting and juicy topics outside of leadership as well. Women in leadership roles, spirituality, all the issues around mountain climbing, environmental issues. Obviously my story and my connection with Chris's life is really fascinating for a lot of people to talk about. So. I'm open to all of that, but if I start with my 20 minute photo presentation, I think that's probably okay, Robin, is that yep. right? Yep. Okay. And I just, I just let you slide, uh, share your screen. Okay, perfect. So let's do that. Great. Now, I know there's a way, can you guys see that picture of Chris and Keith? Yes. You can, okay. Let me just see how I can do that. There we go. Okay, great. Okay, wonderful. And it's great to know that most of you have read the book. One of you listened to the book. That's amazing. Oh, 
I'm so excited. I'm, I want to hear from the person who listened to the book because I heard that the narrator is really quite good. I haven't had the guts to listen to it because it feels a little weird for me to listen to someone reading my book, um, but I've heard she's very good. So excited about that. So this is a great place to start. This is a wonderful picture that I love to include when I talk to people who've read the book. It is a picture of Keith and Chris. And one of the things I like to talk about when people have finished the book is Keith Boscoff and his role in the story. And having read the book now, um, you know a lot about Keith and about his tragic ending. As I was researching and writing and spending time talking to people, one of the people I spent a lot of time with was Joyce Feld, who was Chris's mom, who you know now. She's a character in the book. I call her a character, even though she's a real person. She's actually still with us. She's 95 years old and she lives in a retirement home in Appleton. So she's doing well and she's read and loved the book. So that's great. So as I talked to Joyce over many years, every time I would talk to her, she was always very adamant about the inclusion of Keith in the story. I think she thought because Chris sort of ended up with Charlie that maybe I wouldn't really have a lot of Keith in the book. And so she was always very sweet about saying, oh, Joanna, make sure that you include Keith because you know, they were really very in love and really Keith was her husband. And so he was so pivotal in her life. And Joyce is very traditional, very Midwestern. And, you know, Keith was Chris's husband to the very end. And so she really wanted Keith to be present in the book. And I always had to assure her that he was definitely there, at least sort of for that first part of the book. The other thing that I love to think about now as it relates to Keith is that there are those two mountains. If you've gotten all the way through the book, you know that there are two mountains now in Southwest Colorado, Fowler Peak and Boscoff Peak, which are named for Chris and Charlie. And I was there in October of 2019 when those peaks were getting dedicated. And I remember standing with a group of, there were about a hundred people telling stories about Chris and, and Charlie. And I remember looking up at those mountains and having this moment where I realized that Chris was so humble and so very private that a lot of people in Telluride, in fact, probably most people in Telluride did not know that she had been married and certainly did not know about Keith's suicide. And so I just had this moment where I realized, oh my gosh, here's this mountain that has not only Chris's name on it, but this is Keith's mountain too, because Chris, you know, never changed her name. She always was Chris Boscoff. And so it just kind of was this moment where it took my breath away to think about Keith and the fact that he's still with us in that form, which I find very sweet. Great, here is a great picture of Scott Fisher. So he is such an interesting character. Um, I had such a great time talking with friends and family members of Scott. And one of the things that was important for me was to give people a sense of Scott beyond how his character and his persona had been shaped by the book Into Thin Air. And you all can appreciate that now having read Into Thin Air, his uh, charismatic kind of happy-go-lucky personality was really colored by John Krakauer's book, as well as the movie Everest, which was, it came out, I believe in 2015. I bet a lot of you have seen it. And so his, legacy had kind of been as this carefree, charismatic, maybe a little bit of a womanizer sort of guy. Uh, but he was so much more than that. And I got to know him really well through spending time with all of his family members and friends. And so part of what I wanted to do was kind of change that narrative a little bit to show that he was also this really wonderful father and friend and cared quite a bit about the business. And so hopefully, hopefully I did that. Uh, he was a great person to get to know. This is a great picture that I also love to include of Scott and Chris. And it's the only known picture of the two of them because they only met that one time. And that was on that expedition to Broad Peak, which you read about. So this is an interesting thing that I love talking about as an author and sharing with my audiences. Obviously the work, this is a work of creative nonfiction and I very much wanted to stay in the realm of nonfiction. I did not want to dip into historical fiction which is almost the same as creative nonfiction but in that case I would have had to really kind of make up a lot more details and characters 
would have had different names and whatnot, but I wanted to have it remain completely nonfiction. However, I did want to include some of those scenes in the book where there were actually no living individuals left for me to talk to. So in those cases, and this Broad Peak uh, chapter included a couple of those scenes, I had to just spend quite a bit of time talking to friends who had heard about conversations. You know, in this case, I included a scene or a couple of scenes with Chris and uh, Keith and Scott. And so I would talk to people who had been on that expedition and heard about those conversations. I spent a lot of time going over uh, newspaper articles and videos and interviews that the three of them had done to kind of piece together those scenes. And then I would run those scenes past people who knew them well to get them as authentic as I possibly could to make sure that I was using all the phrases that they would use and whatnot. So it was a pretty arduous process to sort of keep this in the realm of nonfiction, but it was very important for me. I didn't want friends or family to open the book someday and be surprised by anything. So I tended to write those scenes and then run those chapters again past many different people. So by the time I finished the manuscript, there were so many people that had their fingers in the manuscript and it had been quite arduous, but I think it made for a more authentic, authentic read for everybody. Charlie Fowler, oh my gosh, how I love Charlie. At one point when I was writing, I thought, oh my gosh, I think maybe I've actually fallen in love with Charlie, if that's possible. He <laughs> is just such an endearing, he was such an endearing, deeply loved individual. Um, as you've read, he was, I would say pretty nerdy, if I can say that, and very much lived his life without airs. He um, was this iconic rock climber. He would climb with anybody and he was a perfect match for Chris in many, many ways. This particular cover of a magazine, this is a copy of Climbing Magazine. And I also like to include this for you to see because there is a scene in the book where uh, Chris and her business manager, Julie, are working late at night in the Mountain Madness offices. This is right when Chris and, and uh, Charlie started dating. And Chris is kind of looking down in her file cabinet at something in the file cabinet. And she kind of keeps smiling and her office manager is sort of wondering what's going on. And at one point, Chris leaves the room and Julie comes over and peeks in the file cabinet and she sees this copy of Climbing Magazine with Charlie on the cover. So that was a really sweet scene that uh, Julie described to me that I wanted to include. And I love to include this copy of the magazine. I think this was from probably seven years prior. I think it says 1993 and Chris and Charlie met and fell in love in 2000. So this had been a seven year old picture but I clearly Charlie had given her a copy and she was gaga over it. Probably my favorite non climbing picture of Chris is this crazy picture of her in a wig. Um, it just really shows her vivacious personality and her witty sense of humor. And those were things that I wanted to include in the narrative somehow. I didn't want it to be completely dark. I wanted people to be able to see that she had a lot of spark in her personality and, and humor. Uh, one thing that was fascinating for me as I was, again, researching and writing was the access that I had to her journals, which you now know, because there are several excerpts in the book from directly from her journals. And one of the things that I discovered which, you know, I guess it wasn't surprising necessarily, but that I, and that I wanted to include was that she had a lot of insecurities as we all do, right? And, you know, some of us end up writing them in on talking about those things in our journals and she did that. And this actually became a little bit problematic for me as an author, because I did want to include a couple of excerpts where she talked about, there's one excerpt in particular where she talked about her low self-esteem. I think she actually references my low self-esteem. And I really wanted to include that because I felt like it made her more human and that she wasn't just this superhuman climber. I wanted to have that in there to show that she was you know, very much the girl next door, just like any of us. And my editor read that section and wanted me to take that out. Mm -hmm. So as an author, there are sort of some things, you have to pick your battles, right? And so there were some things, some battles that I won and some that I lost. And this was a battle that I fought hard 
for because I very much wanted to keep that in. The editor felt like it took sort of the shine off of Chris and I really fought hard to keep that in. And that is actually one battle that I won. There were many that I lost. I'm happy to share those with you as well. Um, but I'm happy to say that I won that battle. And I always like to hear from readers um, on what that was like getting to that section in the book. Some readers are surprised by that, um, but other readers are um, not necessarily taken aback and do feel that it makes her feel more real. So that's something that we can hopefully talk about at the end. This is another great picture of Charlie. This is a little later in life. This is probably, I think this is early 2006. And this is again, a picture taken by Jane Courage, uh, Chris's best friend out in Seattle. And then we've got another picture taken by Jane Courage. This is also taken in 2006, um, right before they went off to Asia on that last expedition. One of the really interesting mysteries of the story and something that we will never have the answer to is whether they would have ended up together, whether Chris and Charlie would have ended up getting married and or staying together or remaining climbing partners or and maybe not getting married or what that would have looked like. And so this was another really fascinating journey for me as I was talking to people, because depending on who I would talk to, I would have these wildly different answers about whether they would have stayed together. You know, you can imagine that Chris's mom, Joyce Feld, very much felt that they were definitely going to get married. She was sure that Chris was going to have babies and kind of have sort of that white picket fence life eventually after she stopped climbing. But then when you would talk to Chris's friends, they were very certain that they probably would not have ended up together. Maybe they would have stayed climbing partners, but would have split romantically. So that was always really interesting for me to kind of hear people. And I tried hard not to kind of inject my own opinions on that and, and speculate. There were a lot of things in the book where I felt like, okay, I definitely think I have an idea about maybe what might have happened or the reasoning behind this, but it was important for me not to do too much speculation so that readers could kind of noodle those things all on their own. This I believe is the last picture of Chris and Charlie that was taken on their way out to the Genyan Valley. It was taken by a bus driver and another picture that I love to include because they just look so happy and um, they're in a place that they love for sure. Here we have the search and rescue poster. This was referenced in the book in those search and rescue chapters towards the end. There is a scene with Ted Callahan and Kara Jenkinson. They were the two that sort of led up the China-based uh, search and rescue operation. And they're meeting with a US consulate officer. And he is describing to them how it would be better for them to have you know, sharper pictures of Chris and Charlie for the flyer that was being distributed around China. And so this is the flyer that eventually was created. The version that was distributed in China obviously was in Chinese. This is the English version. Uh, and it's just, yeah, it's an interesting thing for me to include. The other piece I always like to point out to people is that there's this email at the bottom, which when I saw the flyer for the first time, I thought, well, is that like an actual working email? And so I reached out to Kara and asked her, you know, is that an email that's still working? And she said, I haven't checked it in a really long time. And so about a year ago, right before the book came out, I wrote to Kara and I said, please, will you check that email account? Because the book is coming out and I don't want there to be any surprises or maybe there's something that's in there that I didn't include in the book. And oh my gosh, I wonder if there's any messages. And she checked and there, there was nothing um, at all. But during the time of the search and rescue, that's where they collected their information. And she is an interesting um, person that we can talk about as well, who I think a lot of readers have kind of gravitated towards Kara and her role in all of this. Oh, this is a great picture. Again, one of my favorites that I love to include. This is the Ganyan Valley and Langu Monastery. And I really always enjoy talking about this picture and this the reason why a picture like this or a similar picture is not included in the book. So this gets back to those things that are in my control as an author and are not in my control as an author. And one of the things I didn't have control over was the pictures in the book. 
I was able to submit to the publisher, I think I submitted maybe 20 or 25 pictures, including a picture of the, the monastery and the mountain. And then they decided which pictures went in the book. And ultimately I think they included, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 in the kind of centerfold of the book. And they showed me the ones they were planning to publish and put in the book. And there was not a picture of the mountain or the monastery. And I was really surprised. And uh, I asked why that was. And they said they had three reasons for not including a picture, which I love to share because I think it's really insightful. So their first reason was that as readers, we have these beautiful creative minds. And when we're reading passages, which are very descriptive about a place or a person that includes smells and sights and sounds, a lot of times readers get these images in their heads about what that place looks like. And so to inject a picture, the publisher felt would maybe tarnish that incredible creative mind that we have as a, re as a reader. And so I understood that, I liked, I liked that reasoning. The second reason was that it's very easy to find a picture of the mountain or the monastery if you just do a quick Google search. So I, I thought that was also a fair point. And then the last reason was because Genyan is a sacred peak. And that brings up all sorts of controversy and potential mistakes that some people believe that Chris and Charlie made on that last expedition, deciding to climb a sacred peak. And the publisher felt because Genyan is a sacred peak that it was a little bit of a sign of deference to, to not include a picture of the mountain in the book, which I also thought was was very sweet and made a lot of sense. So some readers are okay with that and say, actually, it was great that there wasn't a picture because I did have that image in my mind. And then other readers say, oh my gosh, when you have a second edition, you have to have a picture in the book. So I always love to hear what people think about that too. Everybody has different opinions on that. There is one more image, as long as we're talking about the images in the book, on the cover of the book, actually, I have my copy right here. On the cover of the book, there's this um, really lovely sort of mirrored mountain image on the top and the bottom. And I have to say the cover, I, it took a while for me to warm up to the cover. I'm hopefully you've all noticed the cover that the cover is prayer flags. So I, when I first looked at the cover, I thought like, oh, I didn't really notice that it was prayer flags. It just looked like kind of a watercolory picture to me. And I had said, could I have prayer flags on the cover? And then they said, actually, look a little closer, Joanna. And so it's prayer flags, but it's also got this lovely mirrored image of a mountain. And when the graphic designer gave me the initial um, cover design, I was trying to figure out what that mountain was. And I couldn't figure it out. I knew that it wasn't Everest. I knew that it wasn't K2. I had gotten pretty adept at identifying 8,000 meter peaks. But this one, it turns out, was Choyoyu, that the graphic designer decided to include Choyoyu on the cover because that was Chris's last 8,000 meter peak. So a little bit of trivia there on the mountain. This is Mark Gunlinson, who was Chris's right-hand man at Mountain Madness for many years and bought the company from her estate after her death. He is just a fabulous human being really, but an extraordinary businessman and has a heart of gold. Mountain Madness has gotten really crushed, as you can imagine, because they're in the travel industry. So the past year has been very difficult. Last summer, there was a stretch where we thought they would have to close the doors and happily they are going to survive. They still do all sorts of expeditions all over the world. And Mark does not love going to those big peaks and doing Everest and K2 and all those big peaks with lots of money and fancy climbers and the ones that take six weeks to do. He actually doesn't love to do that. So most of the expeditions they do are a little more off the grid. Uh, they do all sorts of leisure hikes and bike rides, uh, much lower key treks and whatnot to different places in Europe and South America. They do a lot of work out in the Cascades as well. And so one of the really nice kind of joys that we've had this past year is that a lot of people have finished the book and then called Mountain Madness to book trips for the future. And that's been really sweet. They also do these 
really lovely custom trips. They'll go kind of anywhere in the world that you want if you have a little group and they'll put together a trip for you. So I'm hoping to do that myself at some point. Oh gosh, Ted Callahan. I also really enjoy including a picture of Ted Callahan, who you now know very well from those last few chapters because he was the leader of the search and rescue effort. He is a total badass and I hope he came across <laughs> as a total badass. He is currently stationed in Ethiopia. He's an anthropologist and a mountaineer and does contract work uh, in different parts of the world. But right now he's part-time in Ethiopia and I believe he's part-time in Portugal. And he was incredibly helpful and instrumental to me as I, as I wrote the book, still in contact with him today. Oh, this is a great picture of the climbing wall, which again, you are familiar with. If you've gotten to the end, you know that there is a climbing wall at Appleton East High School in Appleton, Wisconsin, which is the high school that Chris and I attended. And there is also this wonderful outdoor leadership program that they developed around Chris. And they have been just fabulous about communicating with me as I've been working on the book and since the book has been published the staff and administration at Appleton East has decided to bring the class citywide. So there are three high schools in Appleton and next semester, all three high schools will have access to this outdoor leadership class and they will be using edge of the map as part of their curriculum. So I think, I think Chris is probably a little bit mortified because she's so, she was so humble, um, but I'm very happy that that's, that that's happened and that those students will be exposed to her, her legacy. I mentioned a, a few minutes ago about the peaks being dedicated. And this was the flyer for the peak dedication for Fowler and Boscoff peaks in October of 2019. It took about eight years and an act of Congress to get those peaks named. Uh, so that was quite a Herculean effort that their friends and family um, undertook. And I'm very glad they did. The mountains are gorgeous. They are pretty technical. So uh, they're at about 13,000 feet and change but they are technical. So you'd have to use ropes. They're not um, peaks that I don't think I would ever climb. I prefer to do sort of lower peaks with my, as I always say, like, I like the hikes that I can go on with my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't necessarily need to be on hikes with uh, oxygen or ropes, uh, but the people who I've talked to and the climbers who I've talked to who've been up Fowler and Boscoff Peak say that they're, they've got, got just breathtaking views. So very happy that that happened. And this is, I think this is the last picture I've got. This is an image again at Ganyan Peak. The tip top of Ganyan is right there in the middle. Uh, and a picture of me at the monastery with the monks. The monks were just fabulous to talk to. And when I say talk, I should say that some of the monks spoke Chinese. And so we could communicate a little bit because I speak a little bit of Chinese, not great, but broken Chinese. So we could communicate a tiny bit and then other monks at the monastery spoke only Tibetan. And so the monks who spoke only Tibetan, that was a little more challenging because I do not speak Tibetan. Tibetan. So we were doing a lot of pantomiming and scribbling notes and drawing pictures and whatnot. But the monks who did speak Chinese, I was able to talk to them and I had a translator, John Otto was with me. So we were able to talk to them a little bit about their interactions with Chris and Charlie. I included a little bit of that in, in the book as well. So. Yes, this is a great place to end. As I said, the story raises so many fascinating issues around leadership, obviously, but gender issues and issues around sport and environment and spirituality. So this is a great place to end. And we're a small enough group that I would say, Robin, I think it's probably fine for everybody to take their mics off mute and just kind of shoot away with questions if you think that would work. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Beautiful pictures. And wow, it's just wonderful. Um, I'm going to let Barbara start us off, but then I think we'll all like, I have a comment that I'd like to make, and I'm sure that there are others, but I would like to let Barbara lead us off. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you for that. It was, it was great seeing the photos. I was curious, um, as you were showing them, what, because um, you said, 
the editor had very definite opinions of how she wanted to show Chris. So, yeah. you know, were there photos? I mean, were you happy with her selection and, and were there others you had to either fight for or defend? Let's see, in terms of the pictures, no, I think I ended up being pretty happy about the pictures. There was, this is interesting, this will be interesting for us to, for me to touch on for all of you. There was one challenge throughout the process that I had with the publisher and with the editors. And that was that they very much came to the table wanting this to be a book that was a biography of a female mountaineer. They really wanted to focus on Chris as this very strong woman, woman climber. And now having read the book, you know that she really didn't want to be defined by her gender. And so there was kind of this constant push and pull that we had in terms of how that was going to play out. And the title of the book kind of became tricky because I actually didn't want her name on the cover. I just wanted it to be edge of the map. But for all sorts of reasons, they needed to have a subtitle that included her name. And so that kind of became a thing. And then when we launched into the marketing, they were really sort of targeting women and I felt that it could be targeted towards both genders. So that was one other, um, I would say the most difficult thing that we went through. But in terms of the pictures, I think I ended up being pretty happy with those pictures. Well, in terms of going through what you had to go through, I was wondering about Keith's suicide because um, it's mentioned, let's see, page 138 in a really short note, she says that it had, um, it was a turning point in her life, but there really wasn't anything else about how it affected her. And so I wondered if, if you would have wanted more on that, if not for the editor, publisher, or even her family. Yes. Oh my gosh. So absolutely. This is a fascinating thing to talk about. The issues around grief. I didn't expect to be going so far into grief and how it affects different individuals and the climbing community. And that's something that I learned all about during the course of writing the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had access to her journals. So I actually anticipated as I started going through the journals that as I got to that era and that time frame where Keith um, died by suicide, that I would start to get more from her to be able to see how that impacted her. And I think I mentioned in the book in a brief sentence that her journals stopped at that point. Mm -hmm. So there were then like a couple of years where she didn't write anything personal at all. And it just showcased to me how everybody deals with grief in such incredibly different ways. A lot of people talk a lot about it and she just didn't, she really closed up. She dove into climbing and a lot of people saw that she was not emoting as much as maybe they would have and thought that she was really cold and criticized her for that. Mm -hmm. And to me, I just saw that that's how she coped. And I definitely wish that I had gotten more, um, but wanted to be respectful of her. And so I, I didn't want to make things up or judge or kind of guess as to how she was processing. Um, but so that was tricky, definitely tricky, as well as the reasons that led to Keith's suicide, which also um, still to this day, remain a mystery. Um, and I didn't get a lot from his journals. There's a lot of speculation, but suicide is one of those incredibly difficult things that most of us have been touched by. And a lot of us know that sometimes that just really does happen. And there is some foreshadowing and sometimes it comes from out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was for Keith, unfortunately. What about the influence of her mother and her family? I mean, how much did you feel that as you were writing or editing? You know, did they want to see what you were working on? And if so, what did you do with that? Yes. So yes and no to that. So, you know, her father had passed away. So I had her mother to speak with, who was effusive and happy to talk to me and so thrilled that the book was being written. She had had this really wonderful relationship with my mother for about 10 years. And so she was happy to continue talking to me, but then her brothers, her brothers were not interested in talking to me. And for a while, I assumed that that was because they 
were opposed to a book being written about their sister or that maybe they were interested in money and wanted a cut of sales or something like I couldn't figure it out. And then finally, when the book was just about ready to be published, I gave them the manuscript and they read the book and they ended up loving it. And I've since had conversations with two of the three of them and we're on great terms now. And as it turns out, they were just incredibly private and that just wasn't something they wanted to share. Did that so. make you nervous as you were writing it? Yes. Or were you worried? <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. It made me very nervous and it made me then talk to even more people than I think I would have. I tried to just talk to every single person. So even if I knew I was writing something that somebody wouldn't like, I felt like at least I hope that person has felt heard. That was important to me. I'm sure everybody else has questions, but I have one more. And that is, um, I was curious how the how writing the book affected you or or how maybe it changed you and or if there were any surprises along the way that you just did not expect. Mm, maybe see. all of those. <laughs> yes, I think all of those. So I didn't think I would get so emotionally involved. You know, I came to the table as a journalist and I thought, okay, well, this is good. This is a project. And now I'm going to interview all these people and write this story. And I can do it in a way where I won't get sucked into the story or the people I'm talking to. And within like a month, I was, that was crazy. Like I was very good friends with people I was talking to. And I became very emotionally invested in all of my characters. And after each after I would write each scene where an individual had passed, I was like, I was like crying in bed for a day. So it was impossible to not become emotionally invested. And I think that was probably my, my biggest surprise. Um, my biggest takeaway, I think the lesson that I learned and something I'm grateful to Chris for is she very much lived her life the way that she wanted to on her terms. And she tried hard not to look outside herself at what other people were doing to kind of create the rules for her own life. And that's something I've always had a hard time doing. I think probably most of us have. And so I've learned to be better at that. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Interesting, thanks. I have a question. Um, when, when, you're, when you're writing someone else's story, where where do you draw the line of of um, or, or how do you make decisions about what what um, where that gray area is of where there's a fact about someone or what they did or or what you were told by people you interviewed and then you had to infer some um, either motivation or thought process or something into the and add that into the story how do you how do you do that how do you make that decision or how do you draw the line of of what's what's a real fact that you were given or that you researched and then and then the piece that you add to to add life to this person yes yes so that is challenging i won't lie that is really difficult and so I think there are two ways that I do that. And the first is to do extensive, extensive research. I probably researched for a year or so before I even started writing, uh, just so that I had as much information as I possibly could have about situations and people and places and situ you know, everything. And as I was talking to people, taking copious notes, as I was talking to people to make sure that I had as much as I possibly could have to be able to take that framework and then put it onto a page in a creative fashion and make it a work that had glitter and shine and sounded um, lyrical. And so then the second thing I did, which I don't know that a lot of authors do this, but I've already referenced it. So when I would write about somebody who was still alive, or there was a scene that I would write with somebody who was still alive with us, I would give that person the scene. And that was really difficult to do because I was always in danger of having them mark it up and say, this isn't right, I wouldn't say that, da 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 da, da. And that sometimes did happen, <clears throat> but then we would work together to create the scene. And sometimes it would take two and three and four drafts 
for that person to be comfortable with how he or she was portrayed or how that situation came across. But ultimately, I think that create a situation in which everybody who reads the book now who's in the book is really very pleased with how they came out and it's very realistic and I didn't have to I never felt like I had to sugarcoat anything I felt like everything was very authentic now I will say there were four or five kind of big things that I learned about when I was researching or that I read about in the journals that were too difficult to put in the book that would have made the book more would have made the book splashy or salacious. And I just, I couldn't put those things in the book because I didn't have it in me. Other writers might have done that and maybe it would have been an even bigger bestseller. Um, but that was where my line was. When I just had a gut feeling or when I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, I definitely can't put that in there. That was, that was my line, it was clear. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, you answered my next question, which was, were there things you learned that you just decided not to put in? Yeah, thank you for that. There were, yeah, there were some things that I decided not to put in and I'm crossing fingers and hopeful that someday Edge will be made into a film or TV oh, yeah. series. And so I'm hopeful that some of those things that I left out will actually be able to get put into a film or TV series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I loved the part where you said, Chris realized she liked seeing other people achieve their goals, giving them new things to aim for. And I, I circled that because this is a leadership reading group. And that's what a leader does is empower the people around them and develop other leaders. And I loved, um, I really enjoyed learning more about her through that lens. Yeah, she kind of came to that role and it was a little bit unanticipated. I don't think she saw how much she would um, fill that role of, you know, mentor for so many people. And she did so quietly. I mean, even after her death, I talked to a number of people who said, you know, I never told her how much she meant to me or how much she mentored me or how much I looked up to her. So it happened in many, many ways, not just because she was a female in that sport, but because of the way she um, lived her life with humility and also the way that she managed that business and in innumerable ways. So I'm very, glad that came very, across. Yeah. Very organic. Very. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anyone else have any questions? Do, of course, just thank you so much for this. I, I This is what a treat. I really appreciate it. The, some notes, but as you, the presentation and what you shared with us, a couple of themes jumped out. One is it just, that world seems so all consuming. That this, that this secret little society, it's almost, it's so big what they do that the people around them have to be that, uh, did you find yourself, do you find yourself still in that world? Is it once you're sucked in, you can't quite get out? I see, this is such a group of outliers, people who do that. You just got to be so all in. Do you do mountain climb at all or taking rock climbing classes or do you now? And you also mentioned uh, maybe planning a trip through you know, Mountain Madness. Were you always like that? Is it, has it changed you? in terms of being physical and mountaineering? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, okay, let's see. There are a few things for me to unpack. I am not, that's okay. I'm not a mountain climber. I never have been. I'm a long distance runner, so I'm an athlete. So I understand endurance sports, but I'm not a mountain climber and I never have been and I never will be. I think actually I'm much less apt to be interested in mountain climbing now than before I started writing the book because I know so much and I know how dangerous it, it is or the potential to be dangerous in the sport. So I, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> not remotely interested in that, but part of the reason I wanted to write the book is because I love to read about that world and kind of live vicariously. So I actually really did write the book for armchair climbers, people who are, have no interest in climbing Mount Everest, can't really understand that mentality, but love to read about it. And there aren't many books like that about mountaineering. And so I wanted that to fill this, fill this role. And I think that it did that. Um, 
one other reason I wrote the book, which I guess I've just sort of touched on is the mentality of climbers has always really fascinated me and the level of risk and why they do what they do. It's always just befuddled me and I didn't, I've never really understood it. And so I wanted to kind of dive into that and unpack it. And now that I've gone through that and I know so many climbers and mountaineers and some of them now are still really dear friends. So in a certain way, I am still in that world. Now I understand much more than I did. And I do like to explain this to people because I think even having read the book, some people just say, I still can't understand it. I can't understand why she would do this. Why would she climb? She put her, you know, her mother through such grief and on and on. And so the only way that I can really explain it is that all of us hopefully have at least one or two things in our life, maybe more, but at least one or two things which we're incredibly passionate about, which we can't imagine living without, right? And it usually looks somewhat, I would say, conventional. Like we can't imagine not being a parent. We can't imagine not loving animals or fostering animals or gardening or yoga or painting or traveling. They're just things that we have to do to sort of feel alive. And so for mountaineers, this is it. That desire to live in the mountains is something that just drives them. And there is this heightened level of risk, which I do think makes people be a little bit more critical about their choices. And I will say when people bring in spouses and children, I think the equation changes for climbers oftentimes when those additional people kind of come into their life. Um, but ultimately, I think certain people just have to have a life in the mountains. And so that's sort of one thing I've learned kind of coming through this process. But how long did it take you to write the book from, from beginning your research until the, you know, publication? Yeah, that's a good question. It took about two and a half years from the time I started research until the time it was published. So when, when you're done writing a book like this, do you feel a sense of loss? Uh, that's a good question. In a way, yes, it is really lovely to see it get out in the world and to have the story spread, especially a story that's as inspirational as this. But it is a little bit like the day after your wedding, right? Or the day after graduation. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yeah, well, I do want self time to process for sure. Yeah, I was thinking you're, you're just so immersed in, in um, all of these, the characters and the the people surrounding them and two years is a long time to to just be so you know deep in something and yeah. then when it's done it, it's like the yeah it's like the, the the day after the wedding like that that chapter is over and now you have to I, I don't know define yourself differently or or find something else find a different place to put that energy and passion yes Yes, absolutely. So, and especially this book, because this book was so emotional, it ended up being, I ended up being so emotionally connected to everybody I talked to and because it was kind of my mom's book, right? Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of pieces that were very emotional throughout the process. And so the transition from that book to hopefully what will be the next book can be very difficult. I think for some authors, they finish one book and they start another book right away. They have 10,000 ideas. And that's not me. I just kind of need to sit with the one that I've released. And now it's been almost a year that I've been kind of getting it out there in the world. And COVID has added a whole nother layer of, you know, <laughs> sadness in some level, right? Because I was supposed to go on a book tour and that never happened. And da, 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 da. So I've been happy to sort of stick with it as long as I can. Um, but also I've been kind of noodling new projects, which can be exciting, but also frustrating because I want to be able to find something that I'm as passionate about for the next one. So that can take quite a while. Just fascinating. And you're a lawyer. Yeah. So do you still practice law? 100% no. No mountain climbing and no law. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, gosh. Did you ever practice? Yes, I practiced for a short while after law school. And then pretty quickly, I studied uh, international human rights law and immigration law in law school. And I did that for like a hot minute after law school. And then pretty quickly, like within six months of graduating law school, I started working for a refugee resettlement agency here in Denver. 
And then I went on like a 10 year journey into nonprofits and worked with refugee resettlement for many years. And then I taught nonprofit management in a graduate program at Regis right here in Denver and did that for many years. Uh, advocacy for nonprofits was kind of my focus. Um, so that's where I've been, but now I'm writing. But I think I will circle back my next book idea involves aspects of refugee resettlement and my work in nonprofits. So that's exciting. And that was what was so coincidental is when you reached out to me and then here you have this background in leadership and in nonprofits. I thought you need to be in our book club. <laughs> I know, what am I doing? I do need to be in your club. I wanted to ask you about your door. Is that a painting or is that a, a window into your, uh, what that's you see? A, no, that's a picture that I took. Okay. Yeah, that's the monastery and Genyon. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm thinking if she's in Colorado, maybe she's in the mountains and that's oh. what she sees out the window. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? No, <laughs> I'm in Denver. So what I'm looking at now is two and a half feet of snow outside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love your, um, explanation of you know pictures and what that can do in a book I mean I never really thought about it like that yeah. and so you know you do you look at it once you look at it your imagination just shuts off because right. what I envisioned was nothing like what you showed us really oh yeah nothing and and now I you know I'm thinking even when we read into thin air how I had it in my mind so halfway through the move the book I watched the movie just to kind of get a little bit of context even though it was so different than the book but yeah. I wanted to kind of get an idea but I it's kind of the same thing don't see the movie because then that's your actor that's who the person right. looks like that's it just shuts it all off for you and so right. I, I think that that I really loved seeing it now and I loved your explanation okay so maybe leaving a picture out is was a good idea then I can see why some yes yeah. I mean for people like me who I think that imagination piece is so important I mean that's why we read and that's right. why I, you know, I want to get out of what I'm doing. And I think just putting the picture in just narrows it. Right. And I never right. really thought about it or articulated it until now. Yeah. I had never thought about it either, but it made so much sense to me. Yeah. Although seeing the photos is really great. I love seeing photos and, and biographies and memoirs. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you, Johanna, I loved your, um, the author's note. I read it, I read it on a Kindle. So I don't remember if I think it was called the author's note or the end. Yeah. I loved that. That was, and I read that kind of halfway through. Oh, I just, you did. I did. I jumped to it because I wanted to know more about you and your process. And I thought, how did she even start this? Like, where would you even begin? And that was really interesting. And, and then I went back and finished the book. Oh, good. Oh my gosh. I love that. That author's note. I wrote the whole book. And then it went into the editor without the author's note. And then one day they reached out to me and said, do you have your author's note ready? Because we need it tomorrow. Oh, gosh. And, I, <laughs> and I was like, I don't have it ready, but it's all in my head. Cause I had been living it and I knew exactly what I wanted to say. And I wrote the whole thing in like two hours. Oh wow. my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Cause I just, I knew all the pieces I wanted to bring in with my mom and Joyce and yeah. yeah. I always think that's interesting too, to sort of figure out why authors end up with certain books in their lab. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. You had mentioned TV or film. Have there been nibbles? Might it, uh, yeah. Yeah, there have been a few nibbles, but please pass it on to any film and TV execs, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, it takes a lot of hard work and diligence and kind of sticking with it. And it also takes a ton of luck for something like that to happen. So I'm really hopeful because I think it's a story that tran would translate really beautifully to screen in terms of the imagery and the locations and the fact that it's a mystery and a love story and it's inspiring and it's all of those things. So um, it just needs to land in the right lap is what it is, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Excellent. Anybody else have any other questions? Johanna, thank you so, so much. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. One thing I will ask, uh, for better or worse, people buy the book oftentimes at different locations uh, after they've read reviews on Amazon. People have strong feelings about Amazon. I do too. 
But if you get a moment to just go on there and throw up a one or two sentence review or even just star it on Amazon or Goodreads, that would be a huge help. For me. Yep, absolutely. There's, I don't know if you listened to This American Life. Yes. So this last Sunday was a great episode on reviews and how people, their one person was like addicted to reading their reviews. Oh, it's, you have to listen really? to last, week, last Sunday's. Yeah, it's a really good one. I'll definitely listen. Yeah. And then the other one, have you seen the, the series Stateless? It's no. about an Australian refugee, like a camp or a detention center. Oh, um, it's on Netflix. I, love that. Awesome. I loved it. Oh, it's yeah. beautiful. Stateless. Yes, Is it's about. It fiction or fictionalized or? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, the who plays Mrs. Weatherford in The Handmaid's Tale. Um, is is the protagonist in that and really? stateless? Yeah, yeah, she's Australian and oh, it's, it's just wonderful. Oh but gosh. with your work, you would really enjoy it. It's very well done. Yes, I'll I'll watch it because I can consider it research. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, yeah. we won't keep you anymore. Okay. Other group, if you want to stay on for another minute after, but Johanna, thank you again, and no, we will you. all submit our reviews and thank please you. keep us all posted yes. and we'll. We'll follow you. And Robin, you know where to find me and you can submit my email and stuff. So if people have questions later, they can always find me by email. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Let me uh, stop recording.